I'm Gareth Bracken here at the World Series of Poker Europe for Players TV. Well, we are here with Phil Locke, who just won his first ever World Series of Poker bracelet. Phil, how does it feel? Well, being the best player in the world, it's, it, you know, I expected to win. I don't know why all these people showed up when they knew they were drawn dead. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if somebody like walked around and was like that all the time and then they were like, when they lost, I don't know why I lost. I mean, I am the best player in the world. <laughs> you know? But he would have to be like an older guy with gray hair and like a mustache and like like a smoking jacket and, and everyone knows to be a massive fish, you know? <laughs> it feels great mm. to answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> and um, your opponent, um, Andrew Patton, was he a guy yeah. you knew much about? Yeah, we play in the Bellagio from time to time and I play with his brother a lot and he's a sharp gambler and a smart fellow. And it was really uh, a bit tough playing against a guy that likes to raise every pot because in heads up, that's an optimal strategy if your opponent um, likes to play small pots, which I like to play small pots. So I broke down one time and I went crazy with King Five. I got rewarded for being stupid, <laughs> so that was nice. <laughs> well, I mean, and the chip lead changed hands quite a few times. It wasn't easy, was it at all? No, it took a couple of hours, and I started 750, went to one two, went to 750, went to one, went to eight, went to, and then I finally had that huge hand with six seven. I raise because I was just. I don't know, decided I had to be more aggressive and represent hands so I could steal because I was just slightly tilting that I couldn't be in the PLO. You know? and, uh, and then when the turn, I, I was like, he has a flush draw and some kind of pair draw or whatever. And the king came and was like, please don't let him have king, queen of clubs that, or king 10. I was really super fearful of king 10. But um, I was like, well, if he has those hands, I'm paying him off anyway. So I just wanted to get the money in, in case he had a pair and a flush draw, which he did. He had a pair of flush draw and a straight draw. And then the glorious ten of hearts rolled off, which is impossible to happen in that spot because, as you know, he had 85 outs and I, he was 140% out of 100% to get there. It didn't happen, so I had to. I even thought that he won when the, I was like, "Oh, he has to hire two pair." Like I was that confused. <laughs> Honestly, I swear, <laughs> that's no lie. Yeah. And you're saying the final table took quite a few hours. Do you think your poker world record endurance actually helped you at this table to kind of keep concentration? It's helping me in tournaments and in life, in poker. Since that endurance session. I've cashed in like eight of the last nine cash sessions I've played, and the last four tournaments I've played, I cashed in three of them, including this one. And it's helped me as a human. I feel I have more, uh, I have more empathy and sympathy, and uh, as poker goes, patience. And like I was telling another interviewer, it kind of feels like Neo in the Matrix, where he's all of a sudden his arms going really slow, and he's just wasting Mr. Smith because he understands some of that stuff, some of the doors in the poker matrix opened up for me. I'm not, not making that up, like literally. The other things, athleticism I improved as well. I, Michael Binger and Brian Rast, two guys I'd never beaten in my life in racquetball. I was like, wow, I'm gonna start beating them. And I did, in racquetball. Whereas for four years I had never beaten them. So, yeah, if you want to improve as a human, play 115 hours of poker <laughs> without any breaks. <laughs> so, I mean, are you playing the poker of your life right now? Are you in top, top form? I don't know. I. Am I taught? No. I mean, what's that king five move? And why didn't I call when I had the six seven, three sevens with the flush and the straight and the, all those full houses out there? And when I knew the guy, because he bet two X pot, and I just like wussed out and fought like, and how about, uh, yeah, it's like a whole bunch of hands. So no. <laughs> Not, I mean, but no one ever is. Are they? I mean, maybe you are. I don't know. I, all you, I like poker because you can keep aspiring and getting closer and closer. It's like a pianist or something. He, he's never going to be perfect. A jazz music, they're just going to keep trying to... That's the beauty of poker. It's like you can keep fine-tuning little parts of your game. and It's fun. Fine-tuning is fun. And also you had quite a lot of support from the railroad today. Did that help or are you so focused you don't really notice it anyway? I love the support and uh, it's fun. And my game was pretty much the same either way. Uh, but I definitely love, like, you know sending the pictures out on Twitter and having people say, go get it, Phil. So I love, yeah, I, I like people. I like interacting with the world. Um, the world is like a massive web, whereas poker is a mini web within the massive web of the world, and the universe, whatever, and yeah, 
so it's fun being a part of the web. Obviously, we see your arm. You had your unfortunate accident recently. I mean, what was your point where you thought you might not, might not even make it here at one point? Yeah, for the first 10 days after the accident, I was like, oh, we're not going to be able to go. And I was like, well, maybe if... And then I started feeling like a little better. I had the surgery from... I don't know if you know, but the orbital socket that holds my eyeball up, that broke as well as had I been the 42 stitches. And they had to go in and do surgery, put a new little socket down, uh, which was... The worst part was when the doctors said only one in 200 people have complications. And I'm like, one in 200, that's like about a certainty. As a gambler is concerned, that feels like it's about 80%, you know? And uh, I was like, what kind of complications? Death? And he's like, no, just swelling, bleeding, internal hemorrhaging, all scary shit, you know? Uh, so after I faded that, I was like, wow. And I started getting healthier and healthier. And I was like, a week before we were leaving, I said, why don't we just delay for a week, skip the... So we were going to do something before part two, I don't remember. But we just started compressing and we went, we arrived and then two days of rest then started playing part two. So that was good. I'm glad we came. And did that experience sort of spur you on? Did, did it make you more determined, thinking you weren't going to be here, finally getting here? Did that really kind of... No, because uh, I realized I had to exist wherever, with my um, ailment or whatever, like I had to exist somewhere. The only hardship that I had to endure was the fluctuating temperatures at home. You get to take naps, and you have the same temperature all the time. Like Partouche, the humidity and whatever, and uh, and then playing 14-hour days, that was tough because I, my body really needed the naps and stuff. But uh, so it's just those, I think Partouche was tough because five days in a row, 12 hours a day was tough on my body. I just wanted to take, I wanted to take naps in an air-conditioned environment, and I couldn't if I was playing poker, you know? Uh, but so no, I don't, it spurred me along. No, I don't. I mean, I would have, I would have called with the six seven. I wouldn't have made the blunder with the king five, and I would, you know what I'm saying? I'm just doing my best, which is above the rim, but not, not, not. No, above the rim means super good. It's above average, but it's not like a plus. But it's definitely better than my old game. My game today, in the last two months, has is better than my game a year ago. That's for sure. And which other events are you going to play in the next couple of weeks here? Uh. I don't know, this one and then the main event, I think. Yeah, maybe the thousand, I don't know. Not the heads up thing, I, especially after this. That was tiring, <laughs> you yeah. And uh, finally, how are you enjoying the whole London experience? I love London. Uh, Jennifer and I are always thinking, oh, maybe we should get a flat here. But it's such a commitment for just knowing that you're going to be here for only a month or two. Thing is, if you had a flat, then you could literally do the whole EPT thing, you know, be here for the three or four months. But I don't know. I like. I like LA, I like being in my house and uh, you know my family's on the east coast right now so I, it's easier to visit them and I'm a DJ and I love games but it's kind of a haul to be living uh, for a month on the other side of the earth, you know what I'm saying? I suppose, I don't know. So I don't even remember what your question was. Something about Enjoy London. Oh yeah, we love London. We love. We actually stay at a hotel like a minute walk from here, which is great. So in the morning we can have dim sum for Chinatown and their shows and uh, like it's just great. I love the. Believe it or not, I love the weather because in LA and Vegas it's always hot, always sunny, and I like the crisp and the rain, whatever. I like it occasionally, but I don't want to live in it like year round. Like I wouldn't live in Seattle, Washington, where it rains all the time even though it's a beautiful city, yeah. Well, once again, many congratulations. You're a very popular bracelet winner, I'm sure. So thanks for talking to us, Phil. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Cheers.